It really is the most um, wonderful delight to be able to introduce this lecture being given by Canon Lucy Winkett, who is an ex I'm going to embarrass her now, uh, but who is an extraordinary person whom I have, uh, for me, has been a wonderful inspiration and influence throughout my years of ministry. Uh, before uh, Lucy was ordained, she was a professional soprano and, and still brings an extraordinary um, sense of the gift of music. Uh, she has been ordained for 24 years. And anyone knowing the history of the Church of England will know that during that time, Lucy has been so significant in uh, the work to see both men and women represented in all orders of ministry in the church. And those of you, as some of you may remember having seen an extraordinary program about the life of St. Paul's Cathedral uh, some years ago now. And uh, Lucy was a minor canon at St. Paul's and was the first woman ever, first woman uh, clergy person ever to be at St. Paul's. And the glimpse of the prejudice, the difficulty was, was really quite extraordinary, but also the triumph of grace. Uh, things have moved on a lot since then, um, and uh, in, in Canon Lucy is now the rector of St. James Piccadilly. She's been doing that since uh, 2010, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, in addition to that, she was the founding advisor to the public theology think tank, Theos, a co-founder of Leading Women, a national development program for women clergy. She is a writer and broadcaster, and chaplain to the Royal Academy of Arts. Uh, many of you will have heard Lucy's contributions to Radio 4 Thought for the Day, and she broadcasts regularly on Radio 3. Uh, she writes for The Times, The Guardian, and The New Statesman. And she has a book coming out in 2020, which shows this connection between the music and theology, God's song and music's meaning. The Church of St. James Piccadilly has a very, very unique and significant ministry. And on this day when we've been, I think, um, we're caught reeling with the awfulness of the news of 39 uh, people being found dead in a container, my mind particularly is drawn back to two years ago when I was visiting Lucy at St. James Piccadilly. And in that church was an installation called Suspended, where clothes picked up from an island in Greece of refugees and asylum seekers were hung, um, suspended in that place. And Lucy and I talked about that powerful art exhibition. And Lucy, I remember you saying this is not just about St. James Piccadilly being an art gallery. This is an extraordinary powerful symbol, but it's much, much deeper than that. And you said that for you, this was something about the witness of the church, the church's role in our world, which Lucy will be talking about uh, in, in just a minute. But she said, um, the church's job is to create witness to encourage one another to be people who see and do not look away. And so in the light of all that's there today and the light of our world, it is now, without more ado, my absolute pleasure, Lucy, to invite you to talk to us. It's a, it's a delight to be here. Thank you so much, Bishop Christine, for your um, undeserved welcome. I'm going to give two talks, one today and one tomorrow, on the topic of mercy. And essentially, the theme today will be about us as individuals. And then tomorrow, I want to talk a little bit more politically and widely. Every day, I say morning prayer in St. James's Piccadilly, not far from the font where the poet and prophet William Blake 
was baptized in 1757. Itself a remarkable feature, the font, carved by the carver Brynlin Gibbons, shows Adam and Eve into my eyes a rather anarchic pose, certainly more bohemian than Puritan, more louche than virginal, draped around the trunk of the tree of life, which holds the bowl in which that future excoriator of Christian hubris, William Blake, was as a baby exorcised, baptized, and blessed. And so it was contemplating the preoccupations of William Blake in a contemporary context that has led me to an exploration of mercy, divine and human, in what is an even more unequal, complicated city society than the 18th century London that Blake so fiercely loved and exposed. With Blake as a guide, I approach the subject of mercy in society today from a number of starting points, and I make no apology for being anchored in the particular lived, negotiated experience of mercy in central London, in order to try to offer more general conclusions for a wider audience. The context I minister in and live in gives me a number of starting points. First, a rootedness in the pastoral ministry to a shockingly unequal city centre. Our parish is a parish of extremes, where people that I know bed down outside the Ritz Hotel, and other people I know run it. Second, a rootedness in the particular context of the historic Anglican church settlement brought to life in the buildings of the late 17th century architect Christopher Wren, in whose buildings I have served for now over 20 years, St Paul's Cathedral and St James Piccadilly, where the window glass in the nave is clear, so that the light of reason must fall on the practice of religion. <coughs> Third, a sense that mercy and its operation together with its themes of forgiveness, sin, guilt, and pardon, while by no means exclusively the concern of Christianity, are given great significance in Christianity by the focus given to that theme by Jesus of Nazareth, and that we, 2,000 years later, are still really in the early church. And fourth, that the particular moment we find ourselves in now, a late modern, mature capitalist society, with a sophisticated electorate and a public conversation continually being transformed by social media, this moment is one where the distinctive message and theme of mercy as taught by Jesus are, is counterintuitive in many senses. In the definition of sin, in the felt and understood need for forgiveness, in the exercise of mercy and in the assurance of pardon. One year ago, in August 2018, I was privileged to speak at the grave of William Blake in Bunhill Fields. He was buried largely unknown in 1827, the fifth of eight bodies to be buried on top of one another, with no marker to show where they were. He lay there, undisturbed and unrecognised, until two amateur Blake devotees worked through burial records to find where he was. And so it was last year, on the 191st anniversary of his death, that a large crowd gathered. Perhaps it was a sign of the reach of this unique artist that the speakers at his grave included two poets, one comedian, a priest, and the lead singer of Iron Maiden. <laughs> Each roared at the crowd in true Blakeian tigerish style. No microphones in the rainy Bunhill fields. And at the multiple grave, inevitably becoming known as Blake Seven, <laughs> the organisers made sure that all the other paupers buried there were named and honoured alongside their famous bedfellow. Blake would have had it no other way. For Blake, there was no such thing as a category error. His urgent and compassionate fury was the fuel for his engraving, his words, his mystical experiences, his prophetic verbal whipping of the powerful. But he was baptised. And so I meet him every day at the sacramental crossroads where time meets eternity, bound across the centuries by the turning to Christ that he fervently wished the church would live out more radically in his day, and I would guess in this. The themes of mercy and judgment preoccupied Blake, 
particularly when he encountered social inequality. One of his most well-known poems is in Songs of Innocence and Experience, a meditation on mercy, pity, peace, and love. Taken together with its companion poem, The Human Abstract, Blake's point about mercy itself is well made. The Christian virtue of mercy presupposes a world of poverty and suffering. Mercy would not be needed if this suffering were not there, which in itself challenges the existence of a loving God. And so, immediately after beginning to contemplate the theme of mercy, we arrive at a central theological challenge, which is that there wasn't any mercy evident in Auschwitz. The theodicy question. How can a merciful or loving God allow the mercilessness of human action to triumph? The question is immediately exposed as soon as we contemplate mercy. I'll reflect more on that later. But my first point is really to try to ground our conversation about mercy, as the millennials say, IRL, in real life. Many theological topics can become too abstract, but for reasons I will explore, I think that mercy is particularly susceptible to it. And a distinctive Christian contribution to a society unfamiliar with the theology of mercy will founder if it's not rooted in lived experience and tries at least to face the hard questions. The novelist Iris Murdoch, whose centenary we marked this year, wrote back in 1970 that Christianity is not so much abandoned as unknown. Even more true now than then. Of the people alive today, more generations have grown up without reference to Christian assumptions and teachings than have. The contemporary theologians John Baptist Metz and Rowan Williams talk of cultural amnesia and cultural bereavement. One of my reflections as a parish priest and pastor is that the church isn't so much dying, or at least its dying is patchy and not at all as it's portrayed in the media, but the church is grieving for a past that probably never existed, where everyone believed the same things in the same ways, and Christian assumptions about mercy, love, and forgiveness were commonly held and commonplace. It seems to me, in the current climate of sometimes damaging and often false fantasies about the past, and a nostalgic yearning for a simpler and fairer world, it's especially incumbent upon the church not to be the mouthpiece for a too loosely expressed, things ain't what they used to be. So in speaking about cultural bereavement, amnesia, or ignorance, as identified by novelists and theologians, I'm not suggesting a return to any particular cultural reality. I am suggesting a return to the generative, energetic, renewing consideration of mercy, that is, as the Book of Lamentations says, new every morning. Mercy is an antiquated word that brings to mind a powerful man showing kindness to a servant. Mercy belongs, doesn't it, to a Downton Abbey kind of religion, with, as the old hymn goes, the rich man in his castle and the poor man at the gate, everyone in their place. The operation of mercy depends, doesn't it, on a disparity of power between the one dispensing it, probably a little patronizingly, and the one begging for it. It brings up, in the popular imagination, pictures of snowy Victorian landscapes and cold noses pressed to the windows at Christmas. Mercy is the lubricant that keeps the peasants where they are and the rich men secure in their large houses. Because occasional merciful acts engender gratitude in the ones to whom it's shown, mercy can become then a useful mechanism to ensure that the peasants are much less likely to revolt. One of the difficulties then in talking about mercy today is that the deference we might assume is needed as part of the context for mercy is no longer prized in the society we live in. I don't think we live in a less deferential society actually, but I do think that we're deferential to different things. No longer are we automatically deferential to people with positional power or titles or established institutions. But in our public conversations, and especially online, we're incredibly deferential 
to a certain kind of beauty, or acquired wealth, or a certain kind of fame, or notoriety. No longer is it the lord of the manor who issues orders, but celebrities or influencers who measure their worth by followers online are shown incredible deference, not only by the ones who hang on their every word and watch their every YouTube tutorial. Because of their reach, they can also get the third floor of Fortnum and Mason shut for private shopping. In this context, as soon as a person in a dog collar starts talking authoritatively about mercy, in some ways, we're all lost. The operation of actual mercy is not best expressed in words declaimed from a pulpit, although that's usually the way we do hear the word. Actual mercy is more at home among tears of bewilderment, in uncertain and tentative yearning, than in the echoing certainty of a sermon or a lesson in morality. And so I suppose we must acknowledge that although the Christian tradition has had a lot to say about mercy over the years, the way it's often tried to say it has run and still runs the risk of distancing us from its revolutionary power in a life that's actually lived. That God is merciful is an assumption shared by the Abrahamic faiths most directly expressed in Islam. But from a human point of view, although this sounds at first to be an attractive thing, it's harder to accept than we might think. Our own admission that God is merciful highlights to us, reminds us of things that we don't want to be reminded of, namely that we are in need of that mercy. And we're only in need of mercy when we're sinners, or in more colloquial language, when we've done something wrong or damaging to ourselves, to others, in society, or to the planet. And in today's society, it seems to me, we have a pretty extreme attitude towards wrongdoing in ourselves and others that makes it harder to have a healthy or creative acceptance of the idea of mercy. I see this at the baptism of a child. As part of the service, I will, on behalf of the church, ask the parents and the godparents, usually not regular churchgoers themselves, do you repent of your sins? I often see people shuffling about a bit when it gets to that question. <laughs> not because they're feeling bad, actually quite the opposite. They're actually trying hard to think of something that they can be sorry for. <laughs> well, I could have been nicer to her or him, they think, but basically I'm living a good life, I'm not hurting anyone. This initial blankness can sometimes harden when challenged from a softly expressed do no harm to a jaw jutting accept me as I am whatever I do. No concept of sin, the hamartia of the New Testament, missing the mark, is given room to breathe there. On the other hand, pastorally, I spend time with people who can feel wrapped with a sense of over-responsibility for, frankly, everything. From the melting of the ice caps, the existence of nuclear weapons, a famine far away, or everything they have ever done. If only I were a different person, goes the narrative, this might not be happening. These two extremes seem common to me, either basically feeling we're doing fine, thanks very much, not really doing much wrong, or living with the assumption that we're responsible for everything that goes wrong. Both, of course, are forms of avoidance, as is the making of operation, the operation of mercy into a moral code that's somewhere between impossibly generous and admirable, and on the other hand, unattractively pious and rooted in a false humility that's just irritating. Perhaps it's because I've been surrounded by extinction rebels for the last couple of weeks, but the interlinked two big global issues of our time speak directly to me into this difficulty with talking about mercy. The climate emergency, acknowledged by many governments, including our own, and the forced migration of people. <coughs> a theological consideration of mercy has a part to play in addressing both of these global challenges. Moving away from a notion of top-down human exploitation of the planet's resources to a restatement of our interdependence with all that lives, 
led Pope John Paul II, together with the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, to declare for the first time, on behalf of the majority of the two billion Christians in the world, that damage of the planet was a cardinal sin in the year 2000, for which we must beg for mercy from God and from the earth itself. And the British Library has just launched an online project explaining the scriptures of the major religions. And one of their motivations in doing this was that today, one billion people live in a country they were not born in. It's a relatively new phenomenon in human culture that we live closely to others whose life experience, assumptions and religious practice are completely different from ours. Never has a habitually merciful stance towards other human beings been more essential than it is today. In this context, the church's theology of God as merciful is important if a Christian contribution is to be credible. And it can go badly awry in two ways. The Jesuit writer Jerry Hughes produced a kind of identikit picture of God called Good Old Uncle George, <laughs> based on how, in his experience, God had been communicated to people who had given up on Christianity and walked away. It's such a vivid picture, it bears repeating here. Jerry Hughes wrote this in his classic book, God of Surprises. God was a family relative, much admired by mum and dad, who described him as very loving, a great friend of the family, very powerful and interested in all of us. Eventually, we're taken to visit good old Uncle George. He lives in a forbidden mansion. He's bearded, gruff and threatening. We cannot share our parents' admiration for him. At the end of the visit, Uncle George turns to address us. Now listen, dear, he begins, looking very severe. I want to see you here once a week, and if you fail to come, just let me show you what will happen to you. <laughs> he then leads us down to the mansion's basement. It's dark, it becomes hotter as we descend, and we begin to hear unearthly screams. In the basement, there are steel doors. Uncle George opens one. Now look in there, dear, he says. We see a nightmare vision, an array of blazing furnaces with demons in attendance, who hurl into the blaze those men, women and children who failed to visit Uncle George or to act in a way he approved. And if you don't visit me, dear, that is where you will most certainly go, says Uncle George. He then takes us upstairs again to meet Mum and Dad. As we go home, tightly clutching Dad with one hand and Mum with the other, Mum leans over us and says, And now don't you love Uncle George with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and we say, yes, I do, because to say anything else would be to join the queue at the furnace. <laughs> at a tender age, deep conflict has set in, and we keep telling Uncle George how much we love him and how good he is and that we want to do only what pleases him. We observe what we are told are his wishes, and we dare not admit, even to ourselves, that we loathe him. Uncle George is a caricature, of course, but a caricature of a truth. A truth that we often construct a God who is in fact an image of our own merciless selves. Uncle George comes from our inability when we read scripture, when we pray, when we think about God at all, our inability to do anything but anthropomorphize God. Despite our best efforts in the church, we probably really imagine that when we're dealing with God, we're dealing with someone essentially like us, only bigger. We know about the vengeful feelings we have, anger, resentment, fury, violence and jealousy, the alarming and merciless destructive parts of ourselves, often towards us, ourselves if not towards others. And we imagine, therefore, that God's wrath is like that, only bigger, which makes it even more violent and more frightening. And we end up with something like Uncle George. But crucially, one of the most important things Christian theology wants to say about God is that God emphatically isn't like us, only bigger. God is unlike, is other, free, disconcertingly so utterly holy, completely undefended, 
the creator completely given over to relationship with creation. The difficulty with this theology is that we've so often historically formulated God's relationship to us in the language of something like Uncle George, that we've jettisoned the notion altogether of a God who is utterly other and whose mercy we could trust and might need. This leaves us much poorer spiritually. But it does something else too to a theology of God, which is, I want to suggest, equally damaging. Because we can replace the frightening Uncle George kind of God with the opposite, what you might call a great Aunt Oprah kind of God. <laughs> um, I'm okay, you're okay kind of God, who of course accepts us totally as we are, of course, no one would deny that, but then sits back and does nothing to help except smile. That kind of God can do no more for me than stroke the bruised parts of my ego, can't help me with the damage I do to myself and to others. That God disastrously simply leaves me as I am, and us as we are, and it as it is. This kind of domesticated God is just as damaging a fantasy, because she does nothing to challenge my preference for safety to trust, my preference for illusion to truth, and is a God I can recruit to my own programs and prejudices. The American novelist Wendell Berry has written this. To think of oneself as an agent of God's anger is exceedingly attractive. There are certain intense pleasures in anger, especially if one's own anger can be presumed to coincide with God's and also in the use of an angry self-righteousness as a standard by which to condemn other people. To take up, by contrast, the agency of God's mercy seems to involve one in a labour of self-knowledge and then knowledge of others that is endlessly humbling. We're in need of the things we're called upon to give to others, compassion, forgiveness and mercy, and unless we give them, we can't receive them. God, who teaches us by showing us mercy, indicates to us that our freedom as children of God is not to pursue an unfettered autonomy, but an obliged freedom, resting on those other rather old-fashioned concepts like obedience and trust. Good old Uncle George and Great Aunt Oprah are both ways of avoiding what is evident from Scripture, which in Psalm 85 and elsewhere pairs mercy with truth. Mercy and truth are met together, the title of this lecture. From this, I infer that whenever truth is told, for example, when the divine light of judgment is shone on my life, that mercy is needed. When truth is told about me or by me, I will stand in need of mercy, inevitably. It's one of the suggestions I want to make in this lecture, that in our contemporary culture, we're particularly uncomfortable precisely with the spiritual realities that the operation of mercy requires. These spiritual themes are the operation of mercy in relation to power, to truth, and to sin. First of all, power. Perhaps it's something like a combination of post-colonial guilt an anonymous culture online, and very often a kind of extended adolescence in life, which means that we're uncomfortable with the exercise of our own power. Quite often, we don't really want to think that we've got much of it, or any. In fact, the New Testament is pretty positive about power and authority when exercised in a Christ-like way. Our need for God's mercy, that kind of contribution or teaching, confronts us with a call to recognise our own agency and therefore confronts us with our own power and responsibility. The Benedictine monk Mark Barrett wrote some years ago about his reluctance to get out of bed in very early morning prayers in his monastery. So Benedict himself had surely foreseen this in his instruction to monks to start the morning off with slowly 
so that those who were late didn't feel too exposed. A merciful liturgical instruction, if ever I heard one. <laughs> Mark Barrett reflected on the fact that he'd chosen this religious life, that he allegedly wanted to pray, so why on earth would he not want to be on time in order to pray and to spend time in the presence of God who he loved? His reflection has always stayed with me. He says, it was because after a while he realized that he preferred the dark. It was daybreak that was the problem. The beginning, the consideration of the potential of the day, the power he had, the choices it was bring. It was safer to stay half awake. This has something profound to say about our own attitude towards our own power. Perhaps best expressed in terms of Christian theology through the lens of the tomb in the Garden of Resurrection. Psychologically, it might be more attractive for us to stay a little below par in the gloom, not quite wanting to live in the light with all the choices that that brings. In the Cypriot Orthodox Church, there's a tradition that Lazarus after his being brought back to life by Jesus, never smiled again. To live life awake and alert to the possibilities and the potential mistakes of living is burdensome. And for many Christians, we struggle to embrace that new resurrection life that is offered in Christ, even though in church we're taught to want it and we convince ourselves that we do. A consideration of the reluctance we might find in ourselves to pray is fruitful in this consideration of mercy and a Christian theological contribution. Because God's mercy addresses us at the point of our power to act and our capacity for mistakes or betrayal, or to use the theological word, sin. Not only do we not really want to be addressed in that way, who would? For that way lies accountability and potential exposure. But there's a combination of psychological strands that operate together to make us even more reluctant to be addressed by a merciful God. Not only are we addressed as people with power to act, but we're addressed as people in need. We are then both powerful and needy, and it's hard to reconcile ourselves with either. And thirdly, when those two attributes operate together, we discover our, our own identity, not as victims, which is morally preferable, easier to inhabit sometimes, but as perpetrators, the things we have done and the things we have left undone. Contemplating the mercy of God theologically brings us into close proximity with our power, our need, and our sin. Otherwise, the mercy wouldn't be needed in the first place. No wonder we prefer our own illusions of God, even if they damage us. It makes sense. Christian theology will want to hold out the possibility of redemption, and for that to work, our identities must remain, to use a word that's particularly current at the moment, fluid. Even if something catastrophic has happened in our lives, even if we have done something hugely damaging to someone else, or if we have had something done to us, the way we narrate our own past often casts us as either victim or perpetrator and can keep us locked in that identity. The philosopher Gillian Rose reflected deeply on these characterizations of ourselves as either fixed perpetrators or fixed victims. She reflected on what she called the unmendedness of the world, especially for her as a Jew, as evidenced in the Holocaust. She challenged her readers in a bracing way to resist the easy characterization of ourselves as somehow neutral observers of a horrible historical evil. This was, she argued, to rescue ourselves, to excuse ourselves, from what has to be, in the end, a deeper acceptance of our own complicity. What Gillian Rose said to 20th century Europeans was bracing. She argued that it's easy to develop a solidarity between those who think that deep down they're innocent of the world's wrongs. 
she argued, not for a solidarity of the falsely innocent, but what is called by one of her interpreters, the solidarity of the shaken. A solidarity that comes from being made acutely aware of the suffering in the world, but also convicted of our own personal complicity in it and our connection with every other person on that basis. Gillian Rose's writing has much to say to us about what truth is, perhaps especially in a post-truth world. She said that she was trying to find a way of building solidarity and community that was free from what she identified as propaganda. The only way to avoid propaganda, she suggested, was honest prayer in which we are confronted with another reality, a depth of reality that remains, despite our attempts to domesticate it, strange to us. It's only that kind of religion, she argued, that can ultimately dissolve the towering totalitarian certainties of fascism. Our faith is partly there to shake us out of our delusions of uninvolved innocence. At St James's, where I am now, we're about to host, as we do every year, London's service for the charity Road Peace. It commemorates all the people who have been killed on London's roads in the past year. Borough mayors attend, representatives of the emergency services, and the police choir sings. Ministers of the, of the Crown come and speak about policy, and campaigners come to ensure that the language is right, not RTAs, road traffic accidents, Many of them are not accidents, but road traffic crashes or collisions. It's a service where raw emotions of anger and grief and despair are expressed at the futility of the crash that killed the one that they loved, and the often complicated aftermath where blame is too often attributed to the one who died. Stories are told. One woman told of her daughter who was a passenger in a car crashed into by a drunk driver. He escaped injury, but she was trapped in the car as it caught fire. When she was told by the police of her daughter's death, she asked immediately if she should go with them to identify her body. There is no body, replied the police officer. I'm always immensely moved by the courage of the people who come to that service. And one of the prayers acknowledges our own part in creating a society that values speed over safety. I have also wondered, though, about another circle of people who are not there, but whose lives are intimately bound by the events brought before God on that day. The drivers, the perpetrators, the ones whose inattention ruined the lives of so many in ending the life of one the ones whose sometimes willful speeding or culpable negligence meant that they too live with a different kind of life sentence. I've sometimes wondered, given that church is a natural place to bring our grief and our guilt, what a service would look like for all the people who had killed someone on the road. The ubiquitous and ordinary use of roads is a useful metaphor for what might begin to be a picture of a merciful culture. Because we move easily in that metaphor every day between the identities of victim and perpetrator and stand in the need of mercy in both. In our common use of the roads, a cyclist easily becomes a driver on a different day and all drivers are at some time pedestrians. A police officer becomes a driver, a medic becomes a cyclist at one point in time, we assume these identities, and in the event of a catastrophe like a crash, our identities become fixed, victim, perpetrator, helper, bystander. But the truth is that we move all the time between those roles, on the roads, as in life. Recognizing this truth, that our identities are not fixed as perpetrators or victims, might help us cultivate compassion and empathy that in turn might lead us towards a merciful stance towards ourselves and towards others, and help us live with the gap between the people we know we are and the people we want to be. And also to recognize that in a Christian theological sense, the only gaze which falls on all of those identities, the only gaze that contemplates us wholly, 
is that of the truthful and merciful God. The operation of mercy is only evident when we first acknowledge God's power and refuse the illusions of both Uncle George and Great Aunt Oprah, and second, when we acknowledge and inhabit our own power, our need, and our sin, and when we acknowledge that the identities we inhabit are not fixed, but multiple and fluid. These are not easy waters to navigate psychologically and spiritually. <coughs> Along the way, I want to try to differentiate between mercy and the perhaps more acceptable qualities that often get described as synonyms of mercy. I've just mentioned compassion and empathy as ways into cultivating mercy. They're close, but they're not the same, I want to suggest, because mercy specifically addresses some of the most difficult aspects of what it is to be human, as I've been outlining. An acceptance of our own agency, a demand for contrition, a recognition of our capacity to inflict willful hurt on ourselves or on others, our propensity to make mistakes, our intrinsic violence, our preference for victimhood sometimes, our reluctance to forgive, and our hinterland of shame. It's important at this stage, too, to say something about human freedom in relation to the operation of divine mercy again, because this was a particular preoccupation and teaching of Jesus, and so finds its way into a distinctive Christian contribution. One story that Jesus tells is particularly pertinent here. A man, the younger of two brothers, asks his father for his inheritance early, and sets off on a life of economic, geographical, and sexual freedom. He moves away from his family and becomes autonomous with the spending power to buy the personal freedom he craves. All that the younger son aims for is thoroughly recognizable in a Western culture, independence from family, freedom to move around, the commodification of human intimacy. The return to the family, movingly described by Jesus as the father running to meet the son before he's got a chance to get all the way home, is provoked by the son coming to himself, some kind of self-realisation. And the speech that the son rehearses on the way home is similar to the speeches made by others in Jesus' parables when mercy is begged for. In the merciful embrace of that father, something is being taught about the operation of mercy in relation to, divine, to human freedom. Because we're mistaken if we believe that the nature of human freedom is unfettered autonomy, or that that's even ever possible. It's an illusion peddled ceaselessly on social me media, though. You go, girl, boy. Today you will crush diamonds. Use your superpower. Don't let anyone tell you you can't, you can. What starts as a proper encouragement to shine in the world and to be all that you can be, through the lens I was describing earlier, living in the light, can, if we're not careful, ossify into a brittle self-assertion that brooks no opposition and becomes merciless in its own defense. Karl Barth wrote about this kind of illusory freedom, which in his terms is apart from obedience to God. This kind of human freedom becomes tragically ironic. It assumes autonomy, but ends up in slavery to what Barth calls lordless powers. I'll speak more about those in terms of politics and society in the second lecture. The operation of divine mercy is therefore not so much to limit human freedom, but gives human freedom a home. Freedom finds its home in mercy, which invites and conjoles freedom's choices, as Christian theology would put it, in a Christ-shaped way. A musical analogy might be helpful here. There's technically an unlimited freedom for a composer with a blank sheet on which to write the piece she's writing. Her creativity is theoretically unfettered and there's a necessary self-emptying that must happen when a composer composes music. But she limits herself in various ways. One way would be by time, for example. The music doesn't go on forever. It ends as it begins. It may be, too, that she chooses a form like a sonata or a symphony or a pop song, rooting her present creativity in an inherited form from the past. 
And the limits or boundaries within which she creates are themselves stimulants to creativity, urging a certain pace or a certain rhythm, for example. That the music has an end is itself a mercy too. Music was used as torture at Guantanamo Bay. Prisoners were subjected to constant repetitive music to soften them, along with 24-hour strip lighting and no time to sleep in silence. In this way, Blake's mysterious notion that time is the mercy of eternity makes sense. Limit is good. Only God is capable of handling unlimited power and choice, and even then, it is in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus revealed that in the nature of God is kenosis, the self-emptying that's willingly bound by, in the end, the hubris and violence of human beings who couldn't live with the freedom that Christ lived. And so we can add a redefinition of human freedom which finds its home in mercy to the number of themes that mean mercy is really challenging to a contemporary culture today. Mercy and truth are met together in scripture because whenever truth is told by us or about us, we're going to need mercy. Another way of talking about the truth-telling that requires the operation of mercy for it to be bearable is to call it judgment. This too is problematic. Mercy without judgment by God makes no sense because without judgment, this is condoning or encouraging wrongdoing. Mercy without judgment might even go so far as saying that a state of sin, defined not so much as a list of things we do wrong, but as a state of separation from God, is somehow good. In this way, too, a contemporary spirituality and a contemporary cultural landscape finds this particularly difficult and challenging. Rightly wanting to correct the deeply detrimental abuses of judgmental power of Uncle George, say, especially when that's harnessed and used by human beings, usually priests, the contemporary church, and even, even more so contemporary society, is uncomfortable with the whole prospect of exercising judgment. The Uncle George God is totally untrustworthy, and so it's the issue of trust that underlies all of this consideration of mercy, truth, and judgment. To submit ourselves to the judgment of a God we trust is not exactly a walk in the park, but it is at least imaginable. Because the God we trust doesn't so much exercise judgment with mercy, but exercises mercy as judgment. When we're able to contemplate God as utterly other from us, then we're more able to accept that mercy is God's justice. But this is very hard for my human imagination, which wants vengeance often, of course, and which doesn't believe that transformation is possible without deprivation and punishment. As part of our adult formation course in the church I'm in now, I often lead an exercise with the parable I mentioned earlier of the younger son squandering his father's money. In all the years I've been teaching this, no one really thinks that the father in the parable is exhibiting good parenting. No probation period. No caution in his welcome of a wayward son. Whether we're supposed to think of that father as the godlike figure is not clear, although Luke, the gospel writer, thinks we should. But in any case, the mercy shown by the character of the father in that mini-play by the ever-imaginative playwright Jesus leaves the son exposed to the judgment of all the people at the party thrown for him. As an aside, I've often heard sermons far too easily saying that that party is a really great thing, and wouldn't we want God to throw a party for us, undeserving as we are, and for that prospect to be an encouragement to be grateful? Frankly, I can't think of anything worse than being the son with the robe and the ring and everyone in the room knowing what you did. It's not a party I ever want to go to. Perhaps the party was punishment enough. The operation of divine mercy involves truth-telling and judgment by the only one qualified to judge, in Christian theological terms, God. And this leads us to the more often discussed concept of mercy, in today's culture anyway, of forgiveness. 
One contemporary writer and practitioner in this area is Marion Partington, the sister of Lucy Partington, one of the victims who was tortured and killed by Fred and Rosemary West. I've had the privilege of spending time with Marion in dialogue as part of the Forgiveness Project. Marion's way of talking about the potential of forgiveness after such unimaginable cruelty was meted out to her sister is to say this. This attitude of insight and compassion that is able to love my enemies and pray for them must involve giving up all hope of a better past and is the kind of full stop that offers a new relationship with the present moment, with all that's arising now. It's also the territory of true justice, that which enables a lack of prejudice, an understanding, a grace of being. Mercy has about it, in contrast to all the hard work of self-justification and self-protection, a sense of surrender, of relief, of rest. Giving up all hope of a better past, says Marion Partington, for herself. Even more than the injunction to forgive, which can also seem effortful, the operation of mercy is ultimately God's business, and so has a sense of release and rest and relief. The French mystic Simone Weil wrote memorably, Why should I be anxious? It's not up to me to think of God. It's up to God to think of me. Rowan Williams paints a vivid picture. Where we are and who we are is the furnace where the Son of God walks. In this poetic image, where we are and who we are is the furnace where the Son of God walks, is a picture that captures somehow the paradox of mercy and truth-telling that I'm trying to reach for and envisions the sacrifice of God in Christ. It's not only when I'm at my most powerful that the presence of mercy is required, but when I'm at my most intimate. When I experience mercy being shown towards me, it's a relief. I have somehow been understood. My mistakes are seen as that, mistakes, and my intentions have not been willfully misinterpreted. It makes it easier to say, sorry, truly. Easier to admit that I do want to be better. Something unlocks. Something that was tight is loosened. Something that was anxious is calm. Something that was causing me to hold my breath to see if I could get away with it is now breathing freely. This lecture now is a case in point. One person is speaking and the others are not for now. This gives power to the one who speaks. But the opposite reality is true too. Whenever we communicate, as I'm doing now, we throw ourselves on the mercy of the people who listen and look. There are thoughts and feelings that you experience in this exchange that I couldn't control if I wanted to, and will almost certainly never know. The power is an illusion. But conversely, there are things that you now know about me that I don't know about myself. Therefore, in this context, as in every human exchange, it is the case that I am simply not aware of all my sin and hypocrisy. Despite my best efforts to find it all and name it all, it is resolutely hidden from me. It can be seen by others, by you, and by God. It is in part my growing awareness of this which might take us to church and by and large might keep us there. To follow Christ, to commit to the practice of religion with others precisely because we know our need of God's mercy. Because we live in the gap between the person we are and the person we want to be. Because we recognise St Paul's flesh and long for Christ's spirit. Because there are times when I have sat in the valley of the dry bones of my life and begged them to remember how to dance. Divine mercy is the context for our exchange. Divine mercy sets the horizon and the boundaries within which no doubt I will need your forgiveness and no doubt you will need mine.
there is a false kindness in the assurances of a contemporary spiritual perspective, which essentially says that being made in the image of God, a fundamental Christian principle, means that all we say and do is fine. And there's a false strictness in the kind of spiritual practice that fruitlessly and repetitively talks about sin and our begging for God's mercy and little else. Both this false kindness and false strictness are methods of avoiding the path to freedom that is on offer in a life shaped by mercy. I will end with an observation by Gillian Rose. She wrote an amazing book when she knew that she herself had not much longer to live. Love's work is a message from the front line of suffering and mercy. And she wrote this. To live, to love, is to be failed, to forgive, to have failed, to be forgiven, forever and ever. Keep your mind in hell and despair not. That last comment was one that seemed to comfort Gillian Rose as she was dying. It's the wisdom of the 19th century Russian Orthodox monk Siran, breathtaking in its simplicity and challenge. Keep your mind in hell and despair not. Tomorrow I'll talk more about the political and societal aspects of mercy, wondering how we might build a merciful culture. But today, I want to end on that thought from Siluan and Julian Rose. Because to me, as a practicing Christian, the operation of mercy with its associated demands of truth-telling, surrender, self-acceptance, and judgment is the bedrock of a Christ-shaped life. It is a path that can lead, yes, to a kind of hell, but a hell that has been harrowed by Christ in the act of divine mercy that was his death. And so, in Christian terms, I'm not lost there. I am like the prodigal son, found there. And I then have ears to hear the message from the God of mercy in the mercy shown to me by other people who tell me their truth. Keep your mind in hell and despair not. Thank you for listening. with which we've been given. But questions, please, are welcome. Uh, Robert. Dare we hope that these lectures... Yeah, Robert, there's just a microphone. Just being passed along. Okay, Robert. Dare we hope these lectures might be published? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've just about managed to finish this, these lectures, so <laughs> possibly. Thank you for the question. There's so much to take in. Sure, yeah. Thank you. That's the question. Thanks for your question. John. Uh, thank you. I was very struck um, by your quotation from Marion Partington, if I've got the word for name right, giving up all hope of a better past. Mm which uh, is immensely reassuring if one dwells constantly on things not done or done wrongly. Um, however, I just want to sort of make a connection with something I heard which is very helpful some years ago, when somebody talked about redemption. Yeah. And they said the word to redeem means to cash in, redeeming a pledge. And they talked as, as, for, as an example that somebody who was a convicted murderer but who had repented, that past became part of who they were and something they offered to the future. And that in that sense, forgiveness and redemption are not forgetting the past, they're making use of the past. And that struck
struck me as a, as a link. Thank you. Yes, sir. Let's see. In popular culture, where do you see instances of mercy and truth being celebrated? Possibly not Game of Thrones. <laughs> but where are there any particular things in our popular culture, film, TV, whatever, which you see mercy and truth being celebrated? Mm. I, I suppose. Um, I think that there are, there are some um, there are some aspects of a, what you might call a therapeutic culture, which have those elements to them. So that there is um, within a kind of therapeutic relationship that a person can build up a relation with a therapist, so that they are really able to tell the truth, and that takes a long can take quite a long time, and that that doesn't that nobody dies in the attempt. That that is that that's you know, you wake up the next day and you've, you've said the thing that you have never wanted to say uh, the day before and you still wake up the next day. That there's a, you know, that there, there is, I, I think that in, in the acceptance of very difficult truth, um, that that can, be, uh, that can be where mercy and truth are put together. And I think that's why I really wanted to say that um, uh, the church you know, mercy doesn't appear as a word or a concept very much. It does appear in church quite a lot, but the, but the structure of where it appears and the context in which it appears, I think, operates against, not always, but quite often operates against where real mercy is found, which I think I said at the beginning, it's much more tentative and, and you know, personal and, um, and, and actually liberating. So I think it, it's, uh, you, you can speak about mercy in, in an environment like this, but that's partly why I wanted to try to bring it into the room by talking about the relationship between a speaker and, and an audience, because it gives you some kind of sense of what mercy is needed in a, in a personal relationship. But, the, but the, uh, the, the short answer to your question, I think, is in the therapeutic culture where, um, where uh, truth can be told safely. Um, at least uh, well, once a week I go and say apologize for my sins or sort of negligence and weakness and all of that. Right. And then I come to the kill line through my own deliberate thought, which happens every time I say that it shakes me. Now if you overload that with too much mercy, its truth disappears. So I'm quite happy to go along with you. So next time I say to my own deliberate thought, I'll just have a laugh. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'd encourage you not to have a laugh, but that's really good. <laughs> You're free to do what you want, of course. Um, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, that, that to me is a mystery. When I, when I look there is a mystery about suffering, there is a mystery about goodness, there's also a mystery about iniquity. And I do not understand necessarily why I choose to make a choice, I, I choose to do something, I willfully choose to do something that hurts me or somebody else. I, I think it's really important that that, is, that that phrase is there, but I don't think that that's outside the operation of mercy. But I don't, I don't, I'm trying to reach for a definition of mercy that isn't about saying, everything, well, it's fine, you know, that it's, it's all over, it's done. I don't think that's right. I think mercy, I'm speaking a little bit tomorrow about what the relationship between mercy and the passage of time. And I think that if we think that mercy kind of happens like that, that's not what, that's not what mercy is. Mercy is an internal reality that has to sit alongside my realisation that I chose, I knew that that was going to hurt that person, and I chose to do it. My willful, culpable <coughs> choice, and that's that's important to have that there. But I, I think those, you know, that that keep your mind in hell and despair not comes a bit close to that paradox of that, where you realise how often we make those choices for our own good against other people, our competitiveness, our 
about intrinsic violence, all that kind of thing. Those kind of choices. Um, okay. Is there There's a, a microphone that will arrive. Is there a problem where justice falls over into, into justification? And where does mercy stop that happening? You know, Can you say a bit more about that? Well, um, it seems to me that we're being always asked, or we, you're, 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 you're asking us to confront what is the nature of mercy and how it's connected to truth. Um, and you, you, you mentioned justice, that, that justice is where mercy and truth are met together. But so very often, our own, actually, confessions of faith are actually attempts to justify ourselves and justify the society we live in. And that is a long way from a God-shaped society. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so where justice tips over to justification. Yeah. I think there's there's um there's one of the um, desert fathers, um, fourth century desert fathers, who talk <coughs> about hopeful self-accusation, and and actually uh, contrasted that to what you're talking about, which was there's always going to be a new situation where I need to shore up shore up my fragile ego and dig myself a trench where I can you know hold up my sign and and make sure that everyone understands who I am and what I think. And, you know, that, that's quite exhaust, there's quite an exhausting, continual self-justification going on um, all the time. And so he, he, he talked about, but you know, it's, it was quite deep into, it was quite deep into uh, a kind of spiritual um, uh, consideration of what is the difference between self-justification and self-accusation. But a hopeful self-accusation is better as he was saying, than endless self-justification. But we mistake one for the other. And it, it, you know, it, I think it was is it Sister Wendy Beckett anyway, who says, she, people always say, we're always saying to her, um, how do I pray? You pray five hours a day, how do you pray? What should I pray? And her, her um, answer was, it's an answer of the usual appalling simplicity, stand undefended before God and you will know what to say. But even getting to the point where we are undefended, takes a lifetime because we will defend ourselves to the hilt in the way that you're talking about. So I think these, that's why I think these are quite murky waters in some ways. Thank you. Um, I would wait for the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. No, that's fine. Uh, I was really interested by your um, recapitulations on uh, power, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered, like, if you thought that, um, yeah, how sort of privilege kind of interacted with that, and how maybe we expect um, the powerful to be the people who are often granting mercy and the powerless who are expecting mercy, and how I sort of, I guess I'm quite comfortable with that in the divine realm, but once we enter kind of the human world, where do we sort of, how, how does that complicate matters, and how should yeah. I'm saying a bit about that tomorrow, so I won't, I won't repeat a lot of what I've heard. <laughs> but, um, I, but what I would say is that there's a difference between, um, there's, you know, there's a difference between a, a, a teaching that says you must be merciful, whoever you are, that is received differently according to your power in society, as you as you understand it. And so, what I would want to argue for is a redeemed mercy, not a forced mercy. Because there are plenty of people who are powerless in society, and if you keep telling them you must forgive, you know, the people who are uh, oppressing you, that's utterly an inversion of what mercy, the operation of mercy is. So I, I agree with you. I think there's a, but there's a, there's a kind of more political reality to that, which I'll try to talk a little bit more about tomorrow. So I hope you can come tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gentlemen up there. It's uh, very thought-provoking. Something came to me while you were answering previous questions was around authenticity, which you've not mentioned yet. Uh, there seems a very natural link to me between mercy and truth and how we should act and authenticity. And if 
not fall into mentioning me. At the risk again of advertising tomorrow. Um, <laughs> there's, um, I think authenticity is something that's a really interesting and very current concept um, online and among millennials and what are called influencers. So there's a big discussion going on about what's fake, what's fake and what's authentic. Um, and it, so, I mean, again, it, maybe it's, a, it's more of a societal uh, discussion rather than an individual one. But I, I completely take the point that our own authenticity um, might, might be best expressed uh, through a kind of combination of truth and mercy. But I, you're, you're right. <laughs> I think in surveys, asking people who are now in their twenties, what's the what's one of the qualities that they most prize in in other people? Authenticity comes really high, and I think that's so interesting for a generation that's grown up online. That actually, young people are very wise about what's what's authentic and what isn't. Whereas for me, I'm always going to be a digital immigrant. Or a digital native, I can, I can get into it, I can use it, but I won't have grown up, it's not my first language, so I won't, I won't necessarily understand what's authentic and what isn't in a way that a young person will be better at identifying. We're coming towards the end of yeah. question time. I'm just hoping to get as big a variety of voices as possible. Um, and I wonder whether there are any younger women who would like to speak. This isn't um, putting anybody under pressure, but I want to make sure I'm not um, uh, turning that down. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, yeah, go on, go for it. Go for it, no. We need a, another female voice. My friend, my friend is just a place to go for Hamilton and Neil, but maybe it's low lighting. Wisdom, Lucy, very, very interesting. Mm. I've been reflecting on the old fashioned word forbearance. Mm. Now, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot in relation to the way in which our culture people seem to leap from a fairly neutral emotion to offence quite quickly. Mm. A, a forbearance, I feel slightly more comfortable with because, like my friend in the front row there, I, I'm perfectly willing to accept our absolute reliance, my absolute reliance on God's. But when it comes to the exercise of mercy in contemporary society, there's a whole bunch of power differentials there. So yeah. I, I, I think maybe mercy is dead in some respects mm. when it comes mm. to human relations. Okay. But I'm, I'm comfortable with the idea of the exercise of forbearance as a way forward. Mm. And I wondered if you had any reflections on the differences between forbearance and mercy. I'm really putting you on the spot there. Yeah, it's all right. I, well, I, you know, <laughs> um, I think... Um, I mean, maybe mercy, maybe mercy is dead in human relationships. I, the reason I suppose I'm, I'm exploring it is because I think it's, it's a bit more challenging to me than forbearance. And so when I feel that I'm a bit, I think probably I'm being told some truth that, I, that is going to be helpful for me. So I think maybe that's, that there's a kind of... Um, there's an irritation about mercy or a kind of uncomfortableness about it. And I, I do think it's because it forces us to accept our own agency. And forbearance sounds, I mean, you know, kindness is another word that's around here, um, which I haven't used a little bit, but loving kindness, that, that's really important. And compassion, really important. Empathy, really important. There's something about mercy um, and forgiveness you know, there's nothing more irritating than somebody saying, I forgive you, <laughs> in a way. And you're just like, well, what for? <laughs> you know, immediately, all our self just, you know, all that starts happening. And um, so I suppose I, I, I think that mercy does that. And so, therefore, I, I, I think that there is some truth being told there. But, but, into that, but so if I put that into a kind of head-centred head uh, reflection it's because it confronts me with my own agency. And I, I would rather, I would rather uh, s say that it, was, it wasn't me, Gov, <laughs> or it's not my fault, or I can't really change it. Um, mercy, mercy tells me a different, different story. Thank you. Um, I apologize to everyone. I haven't been able to give the chance to ask that question. 
but I think I will not be showing mercy if I don't hold uh, the safety and boundary of the time of this, of this extraordinary meeting and lecture we had. Um, Lucy, you, you have given us um, a depth of riches, which, as Robert said, I think we'll all be um, uh, mining for a long time and desperately wishing we could perhaps remember some of it after we've got Elizabeth and older anyway. So I do hope you, you know, I, I would encourage some sort of written text would be wonderful. Um, I know that any of you who can get here tomorrow night will have had your appetites whetted for the, um, the more global political look at the nature of mercy in our society. So, um, huge thanks. Thank you.